Uh, welcome to the podcast, Ant. Great to have you here. Ant is the co-founder of Boxer. Um, in today's session, we're going to be talking uh, about the founding story of Boxer, uh, and then it'll go into a little bit around uh, how Ant basically built an MVP in the hard tech industry, which is not an easy feat. And then uh, a, a little bit around uh, his lessons learned raising funding, like how did he access networks, uh, setting up co-founder in equity structures, and then what, what his experience has been raising funding in SA. So awesome to have you are, uh, here, Ant. Welcome. Thanks very much, Paul. Awesome. Cool, man. So to kick off with, it's been so exciting to watch what you've been doing with Boxer. Uh, it's an incredible, I think, vision. Uh, and I would love to just hear a little bit about where the concept came from, a little bit of the, the founder story, and the problem you solve for your customers. Sure. Excellent. So Boxer is a construction tech company. Um, you can look at our website, um, boxer.co.za. That's spelled B-O-X-A dot C-O.za. Um, so a construction tech platform, um, and, it, and it's actually part of a group called the Ikigai Group, which is a manufacturing and distribution platform. And, and I'll explain why that's relevant a little later. Um, but so a bit about me and my background and how I got into this journey. Um, I actually am originally from Zimbabwe. I went to university and I did a finance degree. And then I spent a number of years in, the, in my career in London um, in corporate finance space, in real estate corporate finance. Um, and in 2012, I was uh, seconded out to one of our banking clients um, and was in, in, in involved in a, in a significant um, um, disposal program for non-core assets around Africa. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time traveling on African markets. And in that time, it became very apparent to me that, you know, supply chains for construction materials and, um, you know, basic uh, infrastructure, you know, um, components are actually non-existent in many African markets. In South Africa, we're quite spoiled because we have a pretty well, well developed and sophisticated economy and, and supply chains and everything else um, in relation to construction. Um, but I noticed in places like Lagos and Nairobi, um, you know, obviously most, most of the stuff that's been built in the, in the informal sector is, is, is in shacks. And even if in the, in the not informal sector, it's, um, it's very rudimentary. Trying to get a square brick is, is a challenge in some of these places. Um, and so that sort of got me going and um, looking and into, the, into the idea of what's happening around the world in relation to alternative methods of construction. And I started doing a lot of research and reading on this. And um, it led me to um, the sort of idea that, you know, at some point in time, given the impact of construction on the environment and the fact that it's such a, it's so, so detrimental to the environment and resource depletion and everything else, and this, the scale of Africans, Africa's growth over the course of the next 30 years, population is going to double. There's going to have to be a transition to um, sort of non brick and mortar um, uh, and non sort of steel based um, solutions, non concrete based solutions to a more sustainable materials and, and systems which are which are proliferating across across the world in more developed countries. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was kind of how I got into this, into this uh, space about five or six years ago. And three years ago, in 2018, I decided to leave my corporate career of, of 15 years and um, leverage the experience that I gained in networks that I built across the continent to try and effectively adapt technologies that were being successfully used and proven in, in, in more developed markets and, and make them appropriate for uh, an African context. Um, um, and that, that sort of led me into the, into the space of, uh, I sort of came across a composite block system called Polycare. And, um, and, and, and I realized pretty quickly, a system is only as good as the other systems that it integrates with. Um, and that's where Boxer was born. A Boxer is effectively a, a, a company that integrates complementary systems, be it walling systems, flooring systems, foundation systems, and you know, electrical, sanitation, you know, water harvesting, all these other components that create a holistic solution. Um, so Boxer's, Boxer's um, product is effectively smart green space in a box. And our vision is to be effectively the, the IKEA, the African IKEA for sustainable and holistic building solutions and ultimately aff affordable housing for African markets by 2030. So awesome, and do you wanna talk us a little bit about just practically what does that look like how how you guys are able to put up a house uh in a couple of days 
you're able to chuck it on in the back of a truck, drive it anywhere and, and do, which is kind of unbelievable in the building industry, considering anyone who's, who's put up a house knows how they overrun and all those things. So do you yeah. just want to talk us like practically, what does it look like from the customer side if they, if they bought a boxer house or, or a boxer classroom or toilet? Sure. So, I mean, in, in, I'll start off with the, the baseline, which is the, the existing building process at a customer experience. It's, it's often involved uh, a lot of engineering and design work with an architect and various consultants. And then that goes into a build construction process. Invariably, that construction process has time and cost overruns. And it's a stressful process for the customer. And it's very difficult, difficult to control. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of externalities. And really, our solution tries to cut through all of that. Um, and we do it because we do it in a way that enables a customer to very clearly understand and visualize what they're getting. So we do everything in 3D modeling. We integrate these systems that don't require any water, no cement, no wet works on site that are entirely prefabricated and, and, and pre-engineered in, in controlled environments and can ultimately be flat packed. So we can flat pack a, a classroom or a, or a healthcare facility or, or a small home onto the back of a 12 meter flatbed or onto a container and drive that thing anywhere and put it up in a matter of five to seven days. Um, so what we can do is we can control the program on site very, very within hours. Um, we know how long it takes for us to do a footing, um, a concrete feet footing, They're instantly load bearing. They don't require any curing times. And we can effectively, as long as everything's engineered to the right, um, you know, and the cutting patterns are done properly, which they should be through the modeling process, um, we can ultimately fit everything together like Lego. Um, and, and we've actually pioneered uh, the, the integration of three or four systems um, that for the first time ever. I mean, it hasn't been done by anyone else before. Um, these composite block systems, cross laminated timber and micro pile footing systems. So we're very much pioneers in the space. And we've, we've effectively showcased a number of products. We've done 15 installations around South Africa um, and are very, very pleased. In fact, it far exceeded our, our expectations in terms of how um, easy it was actually to build and how well it's been received by potential customers. Amazing, awesome. So I think what's super cool about sort of this, the Boxer story is initially when uh, we, we first connected, uh, you were looking to raise a big chunk of funding, um, but then decided rather to go sort of an MVP approach where you took sort of the idea from the software world and actually applied it to the construction tech world. Do you want to just talk us a little bit about um, what did you do? What was the first MVP, the second MVP? How did you go from basically an idea and a plan to actually turning this all into reality now where you've got 15 of these projects where you've built 15 buildings and rolled them out across the country? Yeah, sure. So I think the, the first hurdle we, we encountered was um, particularly in South Africa and, and certainly in other African markets, is that uh, it, when it comes to building, uh, people are very stuck in a, in, in, in a traditional mindset, you know, bricks and mortar, and that's pretty much it. Otherwise, it's, it's quick space or it's panelized solutions or containers. So there's very little in between. Um, and, um, and so part of what we had to do was demonstrate to ourselves, as well as to potential customers, what this material, these systems and the space felt like and, and actually physically, well, how do you touch it? How do you feel like inside? Um, and so we realized pretty early on, we were never gonna sell this business off a, off a fancy PowerPoint. Um, and um, we got together a couple of architects, engineers, and we, we put together a, a small toilet block, actually an off-grid toilet block, which is possibly a, a fairly ambitious move because you're now involving sanitation and water systems and solar and everything else. But we kind of wanted to kind of dive in very much into the deep end at the outset and showcase what the possibilities were, um, you know, taking into account off-grid systems as well. So we have a very, a truly holistic solution. Um, we were fortunate to have secured a, a very prominent site at Victoria Yards. Um, thank very much thanks to, to Brian Green, um, who, who so believed in us and, and what we're trying to achieve. And Victoria Yards is a wonderful um, example of urban regeneration, um, you know, and sustainable, sustainable urban, urban design. Um, and so our, our, our idea fitted very much well into the fabric of, 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 the, of the space. Um, and we built that in December, 2019, um, in, in a week, we built an entirely off-grid toilet block comprising four toilets, um, composting toilet systems, water harvesting, solar panels. And, um, you know, it looks and feels beautiful. It's a really nice facility and it's used by the local community. 
Um, so that really gave us the impetus to say, well, this is this is really great. We we got great feedback. We were featured in, in a bunch of press um, uh, press opportunities. Um, and um, but then we realized we had to do more in terms of different formats. Um, you know, were we going to do affordable housing? Is that the route to market? We realized very quickly that it wasn't the route to market because uh, you've got a very success, um, skeptical customer in your people in the affordable housing markets, very traditionally minded. And we decided to go through the, um, the B2B channels um, and really provide training facilities, education facilities, healthcare facilities, and retail, commercial, um, and, and ultimately leisure as well um, to, to customers who want, had a very much a sustainable agenda, sustainability agenda, who were willing to pay a premium and to sort of take a view on, on, a, on, a, on a sort of transformational solution such as ours. Um, and through building that trust and the confidence in our solutions with, with such clients, we would be able to become, uh, make ourselves aware to the, uh, to the mass market as aware, and ultimately derive efficiencies in our process and our costings to make it more accessible to, to the affordable market in, in three to five years time. So we're taking a sort of five year view and starting at the apex of the pyramid and moving our way down. Awesome. So um, I think what was also really cool around there is how each project got bigger and bigger. Uh, we yeah. initially you start off just with a toilet and then the next thing you're doing classrooms and then mine installation. So I think yeah. a, a big lesson learned there for anyone in the construction tech, what's the smallest way you can start and how to, yeah. how to get that uh, MVP out the door quickly. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that obviously yours is a very capital intensive business. Yeah. You're yeah. going gonna to have to raise real money because you're putting up factories and um, basically, uh, you know, it's not like software where you can hire a couple engineers. Um, do you want to talk us just through a little bit of around sort of your approach to fundraising and how you've managed to access networks so far? I know that you've done um, a small round and then you're looking now to currently raise uh, a, a Series A round of funding. Um, but I think what I've been really impressed is how how you've been able to connect with so many investors. And I think that's a common problem that a lot of early stage founders have is how to access those networks and get warm introductions to investors. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's true. We've, we've thrown out a huge amount of mud at the wall. Um, you know, we, we've, we face a challenge, um, possibly less, less experience in the likes of FinTech and EduTech and other more, more established tech sectors. We, 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 we are faced with the educational challenge, actually educating an audience and understanding and qualifying an audience as to their, um, their interest in, in what we do. Um, and it's, and it's, it, it actually very much comes down to the seeing is believing, you know, actually getting investors into the space where they can experience and, and see what we've actually built um, virtually or, or, or physically. And, um, and so we, um, you know, as you say, this is a complicated business. Um, we are talking from a design process. We're doing everything in 3D modeling. Um, so we need uh, specialist technicians. You can, you can build 3D models and, and render them and make them lifelike. Um, there's a lot of architecture and engineering that goes into this in the concept development stage. And we ultimately need to comply with building codes and bigger building regulations. There's a huge amount of R&D that's gone into, into, the, into the product. Then when you have the product, You've ultimately got to ensure that your your um, sales, um, contracting, fulfillment, and um, installation process is is efficient, um, and actually it then becomes more of a, of a logistics business than a um, than a than purely a building business. Actually, the building is it's actually not a construction business at all. It's a it's a design and technology uh, business with a logistics um, platform, and ultimately it's packaging a solution in, into something that can be installed either by us or by third parties. Um, and, and so we, we realized that we had to be fairly integrated through that whole value chain um, because Boxer is, as an island, you know, it's dependent upon suppliers who can give us the type of systems and materials that we need and distributors who can support us in the installation process and the marketing and the associated products like financing products. That's the thing that will drive our, our, our offtake. And, and that's where we, we actually came into um, to setting up this, this platform. We already had a holding structure and we had secured the rights to these technologies um, by the holding structure. We now needed to create the manufacturing facilities that could feed into Boxer, uh, where we, which would assemble and, and integrate the, these facilities. Um, and, and that's where, so we had a bit of a false start on our funding round initially where I tried to raise um, some money um, just around Boxer 
uh, well, just into Boxer at, the, at itself. And the question was raised by investors, this is really interesting, exciting, but you've got dependency risk in your supply chain, significant dependency risk, because each of the technologies you're talking about are them, in themselves startups. So what you need to do is actually raise in the holding company and enable an investor to take a view, um, a, a wider view, um, both on the upstream and downstream of Boxer. Um, so we went back to market about three or four months ago with a, with a, with a completely different package. We actually um, did an empowerment transaction. So we are a 51% black woman owned um, platform now, which is fantastic. It gives us um, significant um, you know, um, access to procurement um, points and DFIs and corporate clientele that, that, that we, we're ultimately targeting. Um, and so that's, that's changed the, 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 the picture, if you like, in terms of what, what, we're actually set, what we're actually are and what we're selling. Um, the other thing is about our this Ikigai platform, which which is now empowered, is that the technologies that we control are are, are, are delivered through green manu green tech manufacturing. And in the context of South Africa, where it's all about fourth industrial revolution and green tech manufacturing and transform transformational um, technologies, we fit squarely within that in that remit. So we can now target DFI financing. Um, so we have a two pronged approach. One is to Target DFI financing. We have a couple of applications in play already. It's very. It comes in the form of grants and and some loans. Uh, very um, you know, quite cheap loans. Um, and we are actually now doing a bridge financing round to effectively get some equity on the table, so that and some partners who strategic partners who can help us in in um, in scaling this platform um, to basically get us through the next two to three years. But when we want to do a Series A. Um, and we want to do that Series A specifically with impact investors, international impact investors, um, who understand this whole green tech story um, much more so than, than the, say, the SA, the local SA investors would. Um, yeah, so that's that's it. I'm not sure I answered your question properly. Awesome. Th thanks, Ant. Um, I think one of the complicated things of your specific business is there was quite a big founding team. Uh, mm. It was you plus you needed architects and things plus funding. Um, how did you go about solving uh, basically like the equity structure? Um, sure. Yeah. So you know the, we 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 realized that we needed spe very special skills. You know, from architects, engineers, people who understood construction um, and installations, the hardware, uh, the logistics, the operations, the sales, um, the, the finance, and the operations and everything else. So we actually assembled a team very organically through a um, through our networks. Um, of people who are purpose-minded and you know, bought into the vision, uh, and um, a very special set of people, actually. Um, and what I then was faced with was, and how do I reward these people, given that I'm very, I've got a very thin capital base, and um, we need to actually deploy that my, what money we have in concept and product development, and ultimately, you know, commercializing our, our, our ideas. Um, and and I came across uh, this slicing pie concept. It was actually mentioned in a in a, in a forum, um, I think by you, Paul, in, in one of our one of our meetings. And I just looked it up online, and you know, there's a very neat uh, YouTube clip in two minutes that tells you what it is basically, and it's, it it fitted the bill perfectly in the sense that people can make contributions to our business, um, make contributions in time or money, and put those contributions at risk. And effectively, by everyone doing that, we form a pie of slices, uh, of sli each contribution being a slice. And um, we can affect, it's all about relative value. So now we were able to benchmark ourselves relative to each other in relation to what equity split would materialize once we, once we um, are funded. Um, and that enabled us to cut through all the sort of difficult discussions that the founders or founding teams typically have around who's worth what and how much equity one should have and doesn't make promises about the future that you simply cannot predict. Um, and that's been very, very helpful uh, in that we've, we've, we've had people come and go and they're very clear mechanisms in the framework that enable us to determine what the exit mechanics are and, the, and, the, and, and what the resignation values and all that kind of thing are. It gives us absolute flexibility and it gives the business a really uh, fantastic platform from which to bootstrap on almost minimal funds. Um, and so, so it's, that has been actually the, the, the real secret to us getting this far. Um, you know, we're two years down the track, or 18 months or two years down the track, um, and we simply would never have done it. Um, there would have been a lot of tears, I'm sure, if we, had, if we had tried any other conventional means of splitting equity up front. 
Um, and, um, you know, we've now got a seasoned team who buy into it, who are very loyal to the cause, who are invested in the process, who are ready to come on board as soon as we are funded, um, you know, on a, in a formal capacity. Amazing. And adjusting those documents to the South African context, were you able to just take them straight off the web or did you have to, uh, yeah, how did so you go we, about doing that? Yeah, we, we actually looked at that initially and we realized that uh, we, we, if you're going to do this, you've got to do it properly. You've got to ensure that there's a contractual basis that's relevant to the South African market and that gives people comfort in terms of what they're signing up to. Uh, it involves a cuts across labor law, tax law, um, you know, various other um you know, uh, specialist subjects. And so we, we engaged a consultant, a specialist consultant that was, was involved in, in um, shared equity schemes, um, uh, a company called Addison Comline. And they effectively helped us pioneer the uh, legal framework um, that was relevant to a South African context. Um, they were actually assisted by um, Mike Moyer himself, who's the author of the Slicing Pie book. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's a fantastic, document. It's called the Dynamic Risk Framework Agreement. And uh, that gives us absolute clarity in terms of what uh, participants are signing up to and what the mechanisms are, what the, what the process is, and how it's ensured that it's a fair and equitable and, and transparent process throughout. Um, and, and actually, that just enables us all to focus on what we want to do, which is, which is build a, a fantastic business. Awesome. Cool, man. And, and then a final one is your experience raising funding in, in SA and sort of adjusting your pitch uh, it's obviously the construction tech world, yeah. uh, small market here. There's probably not a lot of uh, private equity or VC that focuses on con construction tech. What's your yeah. experience been and lessons learned uh, for other founders who maybe want to follow in your tracks? Yeah, I think I think um, my experience has been um, been a real, real roller coaster in that. Um, on the face of it, South Africa, you know, you know, in, in, when, when one is uninitiated, looks like there's a lot of fantastic venture capitalists, very forward looking, progressive, well funded, um, and really looking to sort of kickstart SMEs and, 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 and play a very vital role in, 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 in SA's economy. Um, when one delves into it a bit more, you realize that, well, I've realized certainly that um, the, the VC, as it's understood in an angel funding, as it's understood in more developed markets in the States and Europe, is doesn't really reflect here in SA. Um, I think it's more private equity type players and, you know, who are trying to sort of shoehorn themselves into a VC space and um, wanting things like downside protection and, and various other things that just aren't feasible in, 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 a, in, a, in a VC type setup. Um, there's quite a few high net with individuals that, 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 um, that are kind of sensibly playing in the space, but as soon as you start getting into the into the nitty gritty, it's it, it turns out to be fairly uh, frustrating in terms of being unreliable. Um, so it has been. We we found that after eighteen months, really, of 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 exploring and speaking to numerous investors, I've pitched so many times now. Um, it's it's uh, we've got down to a very small handful of of organisations and and uh, investors that actually understand what we do or actually have a mandate that is 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 aligned to to what we're what we're trying to achieve and and have the funds and actually walk the road they're going through the process so we're in a due diligence phase now with a couple of investors which is which is which is which is quite exciting um, but it's it's really tough out there it's particularly with the backdrop that we have um, in south africa economically and politically and everything else it's 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 a very tough environment um, people are very quite wary of deploying capital into the space and um, but uh, that being said you know you have to be persistent and resilient and just ride with the ride with the ups and downs um, i'm convinced that what i've realized is through the pitch uh, i've got fantastic feedback um, from a range of investors i don't know if it's just because they're trying to make me feel good but people buy into our story but it comes down to when people actually need to write a check and actually need to do the work. That's where you find people sort of disappearing stage left. Awesome. And just to, to give some context for some first time fundraisers, number yeah. of meetings you guess you've done and God. with um, how many investors? 50, 100? I'd say I've, yeah, probably I've had probably two or 300 meetings, I'd say. And I've spoken to uh, between... 100 and 150 investors, I'd say. Brilliant. Okay, yeah. yeah. And, and that's and that's been sort of a year, 12 months, 18 months process. Yeah, 18 months. And and it's also what's interesting is um, 
I've managed to get through through the network and, and the, the sort of literally just knocking on doors. Well, not necessarily knocking on doors. I, I'm trying to be tactical about who I speak to, but um, I've been introduced to networks like the Lion Cage, which is a private network of venture capitalists and angels from around the world. Um, you know, very well known, reputable, formidable. You know, early stage investors, um, and that's brought a whole new dimension. And uh, you know, in terms of people that get VC and angel investing or seed funding. Um, and um, so I'm now into more in the international space, which is great. I'm on these people's radar. Um, I'm not necessarily pursuing them at the moment because I've got a couple of other investors that are that are in the frame. But um, I think if one can broaden one's network um, and build the, I think I think you have to go through a process of 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 um, building one's refining one's pitch, going through a lot of meetings where you don't feel like you're hitting the mark, you don't feel like the pitch is landing. Um, to refine the message, to to refine the, the the approach, and and in time that will then lead into being invited, if you were, if you like, to 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 pitch to these kind of networks that that ultimately um, are aligned to what 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 a, what a startup needs. Amazing, awesome, Ant. So to wrap up, if anyone wants to get hold of uh, Ant and Boxer, where's the best channels? So the best channels, uh, have a look at our website, um, www.boxer.co.za, so B-O-X-A. Um, and um, also look at our Instagram um, feed, Boxer Possibilities. Um, just search that on Instagram. You'll see our story. Um, we, we don't have a website yet for our holding structure, but that's ultimately going to in, in, involve a number of other um, you know, companies and manufacturing entities in time, which are quite exciting. Um, but yeah, those two channels will be a good starting point to, to see what we're up to. Awesome. Thanks uh, so much for your time, Ant. Good luck with the, the last bit of the fundraise. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. I was hoping we actually get it over the line. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.